from the macabre minds of Laughing Devil Production comes another story from the Nightshade Diary. You know what that means. Check under the bed and make sure no one or nothing is there. Is the closet door securely shut? Then leave your disbelief behind, amp up your imagination, and hang on tight for another ride into terror and mystery. And like all good horror stories, just imagine it's a dark and stormy night. And remember, screaming like a little girl is permitted. The Playfellow by Lady Cynthia Asquith Laura Halyard wondered whether she would ever grow more accustomed to the loveliness of her new home. Each time she looked at the beautiful Tudor house, she still wanted to rub her eyes. After the din and glare of New York, the mellow beauty and green silence of Lichen Hall and its perfect surroundings lay like a spell on its new mistress. It was just six months since her husband, Claude Halyard, had succeeded to the property at the death of his elder brother, who had died childless. Since his marriage to Laura, business had kept Claude in America, so he had never met her unfortunate brother-in-law. Yet she often thought of him. So strongly had his sad story impressed her imagination. The early loss of his adored wife, the accident which left him a hopeless cripple, and the ghastly tragedy of his only child. A girl of ten, who had perished in the fire which twelve years ago had destroyed a small wing of Lichen Hall. The building had been so skillfully restored that it was difficult to believe in that fatal fire. Laura felt herself lapped in an atmosphere of peace and found it impossible to associate anything so hideous as the death of that poor child with this place. Could such a thing have happened here and only twelve years ago? In these serene surroundings, it seemed so unimaginable. Laura Halyard had the extraordinary adaptability of her race and as she sat in the great hall, one December evening, her slim, delicate beauty, glowing in the flicker of the firelight, she looked wonderfully in tone with her setting. She was giving tea to the old parson, whose faded eyes blinked appreciatively at the grace and beauty of his hostess. He wished he didn't feel it was time to end his visit. If I may be permitted to say so, he said, reluctantly dragging his stiff limbs from the depth of the easy chair. If I may say so, Lady Halyard. It is very pleasant to have a Chatelaine here again. Lichen Hall has been a sad place these last twelve years. Yes, responded Laura sympathetically. I don't suppose my poor brother-in-law ever recovered from the terrible tragedy of that poor, poor child. A broken man is a phrase one often hears, said the parson. But I am thankful to say that in the course of a long life, it has only been my lot to know one man to whom I felt the phrase could be justly applied. That man was your brother-in-law. He did his duty by this place. No one could have done it better, but after Daphne's death, duty was all the world ever held for him. Nothing else remained. To see such gray ashes and have no power to kindle one spark has been a great pain to me. Such loneliness. Scarcely anyone ever came here during these last years. Just a few old friends, but I always felt he only suffered them out of consideration for their feelings. I often wondered why your husband never came. In spite of the twenty years between them, they had always appeared to be such devoted brothers. It seemed strange he should never once have returned to his own home until he succeeded to it. I know, said Laura. Of course, he was very tired by business, but still, he could have managed it in his summer holiday. I often urged it, but he always said he thought next year would be better. I don't know why it was. Of course, Mr. Cloud, he's very sensitive. He shrinks from things. Perhaps I sometimes think he felt he simply couldn't face his brother's misery. Possibly, said the parson, but I wish he had come. It might have made a big difference. Laura detected a hint of reproach in the kind old voice. It isn't that he doesn't love this place, she eagerly assured him. I can't tell you how much it means to him. I know, Lady Halyard, I know. You see, I remember him as a boy. Why, his love for his home was quite a household joke. Once he gave a visiting school fellow a black eye because he dared to say his home was more beautiful than this. Bright days those were, 
when he and all his sisters were young. The parson's pale eyes widened as he stared wistfully back into the past. I always think this garden clamors for children. It's wasted when there's none about. I assure you it's a real joy to see your little girl tearing up and down the grass slopes. I can't tell you how happy Hyacinth is here, exclaimed Laura. Her day is one long rapture. Bless her, said the parson. How lovely she is and how extraordinarily like... Like? Like whom? Like her poor cousin. Like poor little Daphne. Why, surely the resemblance must have struck your husband. No, at least he hasn't said anything, but then perhaps he wouldn't. Even after all these years, he can't bear to speak of his niece. He never mentions Daphne's name. I know it was a great shock to him, agreed the parson. He was so fond of her. I remember he was always playing with her, but then we all loved her. Yes, there was a real fascination about little Daphne. And was she really like our Hyacinth? Like? exclaimed the parson. Why, it's the most astounding resemblance. I assure you, it gave me quite a start the first time I saw your girl peering at me through the bushes. Yes, it took me back twelve years. She's ten, isn't she, your Hyacinth? Laura nodded. Well, you see, poor Daphne was just the same age the last time I saw her. The day before... Yes, yes, I can see her now. Just the same mop of red-gold hair framing the pale, pointed face. The wide eyes and the same eager look. Something so extraordinarily vivid. Really, said Laura, her voice trembled, and the hall swam in a blur of tears. Yes, a most extraordinary resemblance, continued the old man. Voice a good deal alike, too, and your high synth seems to have a similar passion for play. I never saw any being like Daphne for filling the day. She always seemed to want to cram as much fun into each hour as it could possibly hold. It was almost as though she knew she had no time to lose. Do you remember that passage in Maeterlinck about those he calls Les Avertis? Yes, I do. Laura's voice was heavy. Well, well, I must be going now, said the old man. Thanks, dear lady, for a very pleasant afternoon. Give my love to the... Hyacinth, she must come to tea with me. Good night, Mr. Cloud. Come again soon, said Laura, rather mechanically. Turning to the fire, she kicked one of the large logs with her bare foot, and then stirred amongst the embers with a poker until they blazed into flames. She felt cold and tired. She started when the clergyman re-entered the room. He apologized for having forgotten his gloves. Oh, what color are they? asked Laura absently as though a variegated assortment of gloves were likely to be lying about the hall. Gray, here they are. I'm so sorry to have troubled you. Stop one moment, Mr. Cloud. There was something I meant to ask you. How do you think my husband is looking? I think he looks well, Lady Halyard, quite well. He always was a magnificent fellow. Yes, I think he looks quite well. But since you ask me, the only thing I notice about him is a sort of strained expression on his face, in his eyes, and on his forehead. It's as though he were making some kind of mental effort, as if he were trying to remember something. Trying to remember something? Yes, he looks as I feel I must look when I'm struggling with my daily crossword. No doubt it's the result of all his work in that office. I'm so glad to see him out of it. Somehow I can't picture any halyard in an office. Oh, yes, Claude was always made for country life. Good night, Lady Halyard, good night. Left to herself, Laura crouched over the blazing fire. Claude made for country life? Yes, so she had always thought. In America he had seemed an exile pining for his native land, and yet now that they were at his beloved home, and it had proved more beautiful than even his rhapsodies had led her to expect, what was the matter? To her growing disappointment, she could not help admitting that her husband's spirits, never steady, were on the whole much lower than they used to be. A sultry gloom seemed settling on him. Then that look of strain the parson had noticed. Others had commented on this. What could cause it, now that the present and the future seemed so fair? Business worries? Laura wondered almost hopefully. No, what business worries could he have? He told her everything. 
told her everything, did he? Laura almost laughed aloud. That very afternoon she had re-encountered that threadbare phrase, the heroine of the bad novel she had been reading, a woman in total darkness concerning her husband, had confidently asserted, He tells me everything. How could any human being ever tell anyone everything? No doubt Claude had got something on his mind. Since their homecoming, she had been conscious of a barrier between them. In old days of challenge, he would often admit to a fit of depression. Now he seemed rather to resent any inquiry as to his health or spirits. If she said, Is anything the matter? He would answer, almost irritably, The matter? No, nothing's the matter. Don't suggest things. Laura was not left to her reflection for long. Her husband, a tall, handsome man, came into the room with her daughter, Hyacinth, riding on his shoulders, her mop of red-gold hair shining above his dark head. The three of them settled around the fire. Hyacinth, with her knees drawn up to her pointed chin and her wide eyes staring into the flames, made but a poor pretense of listening to her father reading Ivanhoe for her benefit. The moment the chapter was finished, she sprang onto the tips of her toes and stood quivering like a flame released. "'May I go now?' her whole eager being seemed to express. Struck afresh by the gleaming quality of her beauty, her father gazed at her lovingly, so breathlessly full of life. Are she perhaps to have playfellows of her own age? Are you lonely, Sprite? he asked her tenderly. Lonely? Oh, no. I'm never, never lonely here. There was a note of exultation in the child's happy laugh. I must go now, she said excitedly. As slipping out of her father's arms, she darted up the dark oak stairs and with a wave of her hand disappeared from her parents' gaze. Long after she had turned the corner that took her out of sight, they heard her running footsteps and her voice trilling out, Come, lasses and lads, take leave of your dads. Hyson's voice matches her face so marvelously, doesn't it, Claude? said Laura. Not many people's do. Hers has that piercing quality of crystal youth. It's like cold, cold water or biting into an apple. Claude rose to throw another log onto the blazing fire. Laura, what does Hythens mean by saying she's never lonely here? I don't know, Claude, but now you ask, haven't you noticed how different she is since we came here? Do you remember how listless she sometimes used to seem? I often got quite worried and thought that perhaps I ought to borrow some bright child to keep her company. But now she's always as happy as the day is long. In fact, to tell the honest truth, I can't help rather missing her moods, or at least her dependence on me. You see, she used so to want me. Don't you remember how she was always imploring me to read to her or tell her stories? Doesn't she now? asked Claude. No. Nowadays I can scarcely ever persuade her to stay with me. She's always rushing away, as though she has something better to do. It's little I see of her beyond her heels and the back of her head. She's so strangely self-sufficient. Between you and me, Claude, I think she's almost disquietingly happy. Disquietingly happy? What do you mean, Laura? Well, I mean, it's almost uncanny. Really, I don't know how to put it into words. But it's it's as though she had some resource we don't know about. She seems so occupied. Yes, that's it. Occupied. It sounds too silly, but it's as though being by herself... We're not being alone. She's grown a queer new sort of smile lately, too. A stealthy, sidelong smile. And the comings and goings of that smile don't have any connection with what any of us say or do. Haven't you noticed it? Claude, do you remember what that spooky friend of mine said about Hyacinth? No, I don't, Claude answered shortly. Some absurdity, I'm sure, from what I remember of her. She said... Now there's a child that should see things. Her muddy vesture of decay is too transparent to close her in. She said she had what she called listening eyes and the thinnest lids she had ever seen. Nonsense, I thought it at the time, but now, Claude, I sometimes wonder. This old place? Oh, Lord, for heaven's sake, don't start any of that psychic rot here. Surprised at the annoyance in her husband's voice, Laura laughed. I know, dear, you think no American can come near a stately home of England without peopling it with ghosts, but I assure you I haven't. 
to relapse into my native tongue, sensed anything unpleasant here. I've had neither sight nor sound of abbots carrying their heads, nor of ladies in blood-speckled shrouds. No, indeed. On the contrary, I'm conscious of a something that's happy, gay, blithe. I don't know what to call it, but there seems a sort of liveliness about the atmosphere of this house, especially upstairs, and almost especially in that room Hyacinth insisted on having as her playroom, the old day nursery. I don't want her to use that room, said Claude gruffly. I know, dear, I know, his wife responded sympathetically. But she insisted. Poor fellow, she thought. How sensitive he is. Of course, it had been his little niece Daphne's playroom. Probably she had romped in it just before her life ended so tragically. Laura reproached herself. She should never have allowed Hyson to appropriate that particular room, for Claude, its association with Daphne, were too strong. She should have remembered how he winced at any reminder of that poor dead child. Laura shuddered at the thought of the horror of her death. Ten years old, just the same age as Hyacinth. I promise you there's nothing unpleasant in that room, Laura went on, but please don't think me silly. I do feel an atmosphere in it, a happy, youthful one. When I sit in that room, as I often do, memories of my own childhood break out of the past and come thronging around me. I feel the years simply slipping off me, she laughed. Why, I get funny impulses to play, to dance, to jump about. My toes begin to twiddle. It's as though there was some invitation in the room. You'll think me too absurd, but once I actually found myself hiding in the cupboard, just as though I expected someone to come and search for me, and yet all the time I knew Hyacinth must be in bed and asleep. Sometimes I long to mount the old rocking horse and have a gallop. I would, too, only I'm so afraid of being caught by one of those terribly grown-up housemaids. Once I thought I heard light scuffling steps and a sort of soft tittering. Imagination, of course. And yet, I suppose generations and generations of children have played in that room. Yes, said Claude. His voice was very gruff. And as he spoke, he raised the times and held it like a wall between him and any further confidences. Conscious of having annoyed him, Laura went away to tell Hyacinth it was bedtime. It was half an hour before she found her in the hayloft, and then she had great difficulty in coaxing her indoors. At last, she handed her over to her maid, Bessie. The moment she returned to the hall, her husband rose, saying he would go and say good night to Hyacinth. You won't find that little flibberty gibbet in bed. I had such a tussle to get her in. It's the same thing every night. However, late I leave her, she always says, I haven't had nearly time enough to play. Not nearly time enough to play, echoed Claude. She doesn't say that. Not Hyacinth. Yes, why shouldn't she? exclaimed Laura, puzzled by the violence of his manner. But giving no answer, Claude hastened from the room. That night at dinner, when Laura asked him why he had been so struck by those very ordinary words of Hyacinth's that she had repeated, he said he had no idea to what she was alluding. Couldn't remember her quoting Hyacinth in that it must be one of her silly fancies. Puzzled and hurt, Laura dropped the subject. Claude did not look well, and tonight that expression of strain was very noticeable. How had the old person described it? As though he were trying to remember something? No, she didn't think that was what the expression in Claude's cavernous gray eyes suggested. But when she tried to define it to herself, she felt completely baffled. A few days later, the halyards were walking in the garden. A strong wind blew. The trees were bare and crisp leaves. The color of Hyson's hair rustled around their feet. As usual, their thoughts turned on their adored child. I thought Hyson looked very pale at luncheon, said Claude. Yes, answered his wife. Not a child. She went out of doors last night. Out of doors? Yes. Bessie found her shoes and stockings drenched this morning. And when I asked her, the little wretch owned she had gone out long after we were in bed. Just think how cold it must have been. She wouldn't tell me why she had done it. And when I said she must promise not to do it again, she burst into tears. Little Sprite laughed Claude. She still thinks of sleep as waste of time. I hope it may be. Heavens, just look at her now. What is she doing? I never saw a child run so fast all alone. 
Hyacinth, her face wildly tense, flashed past them on long spindly legs. Her speed, surprising for her age, never slackened until, with arms outstretched to touch it, she reached an acacia tree, at the foot of which, panting and laughing, she flung herself to the ground. Her parents approached. Well done, Hyacinth. You were going fast. I nearly won that time, exclaimed the excited child, her green eyes blazing. Oh, so, so nearly. You nearly won? What do you mean by you nearly won? Were you racing one leg against the other? Hyacinth flushed, smiled nervously, sprang to her feet, and in an instant had run out of sight behind the great yew hedge. Funny child, said her mother with an uneasy laugh. She's always running off, just as though she had an appointment elsewhere. She never seems to need me now. Do you remember how she used to think it's such a treat to sleep with me? Now she never wants to. You know, Claude, it sounds ridiculous, but nowadays, when I go into that child's room, I feel as if I were interrupting. As she spoke, Laura gave a slight shiver. Her own words seemed to crystallize vague misgivings of which she had scarcely been aware. Interrupting, echoed Claude. Interrupting what? I don't know, she answered hopelessly and turned toward the house. Claude whistled for his dogs and set off for a long walk. That evening, Laura went to see Hythens in bed. Darling, she said wheedlingly, wouldn't you like to come and sleep with Mummy tonight? We'll have early morning tea together and play Ludo on my big pillow. An anxious look flitted across the child's sweet but rather set face. Thank you, Mummy, darling, she answered shyly but decidedly. Only I'm so happy in my own lovely room. I love it, and I don't think it would like to be left. Intense relief shone in her bright eyes, when in silent agreement her mother kissed her good night. Good mummy, she cooed, and with a little static wiggle she turned her radiant face towards the window. That night it was very late before Laura rejoined her husband after dinner. The great bow window in the hall was uncurtained, and the moonlight streamed in, its slanting green shafts mingling with the flickering red from the blazing fire by which Claude sat in an open book on his knee. "'Where have you been all this time, Laura?' he asked, glancing up at her face. "'What have you been doing? I hope Hyacinth hasn't been up to any more of her pranks.' "'No,' Laura answered quickly, "'but I have. What do you mean?' "'I mean I've been what you'd call silly.' You remember what I told you about those funny feelings I get in the playroom? Well, directly after I left you over your coffee, I felt I wanted to go to the playroom. Don't frown, Claude. I couldn't help it. I simply had to go. My feet just took me there. Well, as I went along the passage, I heard a faint noise. A queer sort of a rushing noise. I opened the door. What do you think I saw, Claude? The rocking horse was plunging to and fro, going furiously without a rider. Well, said Claude, no doubt Hyacinth heard you coming and, knowing she should be in bed, jumped off and ran out of the other door. So I thought, so I hoped, but I rushed straight to her room and found her fast asleep. Well, then, it must have been one of the maids. No, there was no one about. They were all down at their supper. When I got back to the playroom, the rocking horse was gradually subsiding. I watched it, and soon it was quite motionless. No. You do surprise me, cheered Claude. The queer thing, said Laura solemnly, was that even while the rocking horse was galloping so fast, the stirrups were not swaying, as they naturally would. No, they were quite taut, stretched out forwards, just as if... Look here, exclaimed Claude angrily, what are you driving at? What have you been reading? What have you been eating? Rocking horse, indeed. It sounds more like a nightmare. I never knew Hyacinth had a rocking horse. Who gave it to her? No one. We found it here. It was Daphne's. You must have seen it. Vermilion nostrils and minus a tail. But do you mean to say, haven't you ever been in the playroom since you came home? No. How extraordinary. Why should I? Claude's voice was fierce and he glared at his wife. Quite, quite, said Laura nervously. She was surprised and shocked at the tone of his voice and the expression on his face. Why, for a second, he had looked at her as though he hated her. Was it possible? Claude, her gently courteous husband, whose devotion to her was almost a joke to their friends? 
Oh, I forgot my spectacles, she said confusedly. I'll run up and fetch them. I shan't be two minutes. With this excuse, she ran upstairs, leaving her husband moodily staring at her spectacles, which lay conspicuous on the table where she had just placed them. Five minutes later, she returned. Glancing at her, Claude knew that if she had not been flushed, she would have been very pale. What is it now? With her back to him, Laura stood facing the fire. She spoke quickly in a very low voice, as though she feared to hear her own words. As I got near the playroom, I heard the gramophone playing. I thought I heard dancing feet, but when I opened the door, there was no one in the room. You won't believe me, Claude, but there was no one in the room. No one. And yet a record had just been set going. It was boys and girls come out to play. Before I found the electric switch, I thought I felt something very light brush past me. Almost before I was aware of it, it had gone. Oh, so quickly, just like a puff of wind. To make sure, I went to all the maids' bedrooms. One of them might have started the gramophone, but they were all in bed. Then I went to Hyson's room. I crept in, so as not to wake her if she was asleep, and she was, yes, sound asleep. But as I looked at her, I heard a tap-tap at the window. It might have been a branch. Anyhow, it woke her. She sprang up in a second, wide, wide awake, with such a joyful, welcoming expression on her excited little face. Then she saw me, and she looked sort of scared and sorry. Yes, very sorry to see me. Oh, Claude, I couldn't bear the look on her face when she saw me. Laura's last words came from her like a cry, and she turned to Claude with outstretched arms, as though appealing against she knew not what. Damnation, he cried, springing to his feet. I can't stand any more of this. Look here, Laura, darling. We'll all go away tomorrow. It's obvious you need a change. We've been here too long. After all, you aren't used to staying like a tree in one place. Besides, it will be great fun to take Hyacinth to London, won't it? Laura, my sweet darling, Laura, say you like this plan. Of course, I should love it, murmured Laura, clasped in his arms. It was such joy to feel herself carried on this wave of tenderness back into the haven of love in which until recently she had felt so secure that any proposal would have seemed welcome. If only he would go on looking at her now with love in his eyes, what matter where they went? And yet, even in the intensity of her relief, Laura was conscious of the irony of his wishing to leave the home he had always described as the earthly paradise. It was decided that they should leave the very next day, but alas, when tomorrow came, their plan could not be carried out. Hyacinth had sprained her ankle very badly and was unable to put her foot on the ground. When told the news, Laura hurried to her daughter's room. She found her sitting up in bed. Her face was flushed, and she looked shy. Poor darling, this is sad. However did it happen? I'm so sorry, Mummy. Hyacinth spoke hurriedly and nervously, but... I'm afraid I've been naughty again. Don't be very angry with me, but I went out again last night and... You went out? Oh, Hyacinth, darling, you promised you wouldn't. I'm so sorry, Mommy, but it was such a lovely night. Such bright, bright moonlight. It made me forget. I mustn't, and I simply couldn't say no. The sooner you learn to say no to yourself, the better. I shan't be able to trust you any more. You've hurt yourself, so I won't scold you. But you must never, never do such a thing again. Anyhow, what happened? How did you hurt your silly self? I had a fall. What? Running? No, answered Hyacinth reluctantly. I was climbing a tree. Climbing a tree? Good heavens! You might have broken your leg and lain out all night. Which tree? The big elm, the one Daddy made a house in when he was little. A little branch broke. Well, you've had what Nanny used to call a natural punishment, so I won't say any more. Lie still now, until the doctor comes. After the doctor had bound up Hyson's ankle, her mother went to look at the elm tree. She was appalled at the height of the broken branch. It seemed almost a miracle the child was not more seriously hurt. She returned to question her. You don't mean to tell me you fell from where a branch is broken off, right up near the top of the tree? Yes, but you see, there were so many branches that I paused on all the way down, I only really felt just the last bit. 
but I had no idea you could climb so high. Surely you can't have got all that way up without any help. Oh, yes, I did, cried Hyson triumphantly. And she climbed even higher, but then, of course, her legs are a little longer. She? Who is she? Hyson flushed scarlet, and in confusion flung her arms round her mother's neck. Glancing quickly all around the room, she put her finger in front of her mouth. Don't tell Daddy. Oh, Mommy, please, please don't tell, she said in a scared, panting voice. Not one word more would she say. After that one unguarded moment, her whole being was clenched in silence. At first her mother tried to coax her into an explanation, but alarmed by her flushed, excited face, she took her temperature. Finding her a little feverish, she did not like to press her any further. She seemed so troubled. Laura did not tell her husband of Hyson's strange slip. She climbed even higher. How could she tell him of that? She dreaded to hear him speak in that new sharp way, so utterly unlike his old self. After all, Hyson's fall must have been a considerable shock. Perhaps she had not known what she was saying. The next day the child seemed better, and Laura made another attempt to cross-question her about her accident. But at the first word of inquiry, the child's flower-like mouth set in a thin, hard line, and an expression came into her eyes that was like a shudder between her and her mother. During the following day, she was affectionate, but somehow guarded, and Laura felt strangely out of touch with her. On everyone's account, she longed for a change and chafed at the enforced postponement of their plans. Claude, though, now uniformly gentle in his manner, seemed increasingly depressed. Laura was determined to leave the first possible day, but unfortunately Hyson's injury proved more serious than had been supposed, and her ankle took a long time to recover. No bedridden child had ever been so little trouble. In fact, she seemed almost unnaturally contented. Whenever her mother read aloud to her, she was politely quiescent, but her manner was that of one who makes a necessary concession and waits with as good a grace as can be commanded. Her gladness when the book closed was evident, and when her mother turned to leave the room, she would wave her hand over gratefully and raise herself a little on her pillows with a look of relief and a hovering smile of happy expectancy. Though Laura tried to shut her mind to the impression made by Hyson's manner, she could not succeed. Stung out of her usual self-control, she once cried out, what is it, Hyacinth? Why are you always waiting now, waiting for me to go? A look of fear quivered across the child's sensitive face. Waiting? What do you mean, Mummy? Why do you think I want you to go? And with unskilled evasiveness, she began to talk of irrelevancies. The cat's kittens, the new gardener, the pony that had kicked the groom. Anything that came into her head. With a heavy heart and a sense of absurdity, Laura agreed in making conversation with a child whose confidences she had once so completely possessed. Though Hyacinth was full of strange whims, the one her mother thought the queerest was her insistence on having the rocking horse brought into her bedroom. But, darling, it will take up so much room, and whatever is the use of having a rocking horse you can't ride? But Hyacinth's pale, peaked face set in obstinacy. I want it, I need it, was all she would say. So the shabby old rocking horse was dragged along the passage and stood in a rested prance at the foot of the child's bed. That evening as Laura came into the room, Hyson gave an obvious start and turning to her mother in flushed uneasiness said querulously, Aren't I old enough yet, mother, for people to knock at my door before they come into my room? You always tell me I must knock at your door. Amazed and hurt, Laura looked at the usually so gentle child, whose worried gaze she noticed was now fixed on the rocking horse. Glancing at it herself, her glance became a stare. Was it her fancy, or was it slightly, almost imperceptibly moving? Have you been out of bed, Hyson? she asked suspiciously. Oh, no, Mummy. Why? Only I thought perhaps you had been very naughty and got on the rocking horse. When I came in, I thought it was just moving as if it had been in motion. It wasn't quite still. But of course it must have been my fancy. With unwanted eagerness, Hyson said, Will you read to me now, Mummy? Laura readily consented. Before I begin, though, she said, I must tell you some good news. The doctor says you may get up in a week, and the very day after you get up, we are going to take you to London. You are going to take me to London? Hyson's voice was sharp with dismay. 
Yes, darling, won't it be fun? To her distress, Hyson burst into tears. Oh, no, mummy. No, no, no. Please don't take me away from here. I can't go. I won't go. It wouldn't be fair. What do you mean, you absurd child? You'll have a lovely time in London. We'll take you to the zoo and Madame Tussauds and have pink ices at Gunther's. We'll do all the treats I used to tell you about in New York. Hyson's eyes walled with tears. Oh, please, Mommy, she implored. Don't take me away from lovely here. But my darling, I love you to love this place, but you can't always be here. It will be all the more fun to come back to it. She tried to laugh the child out of her distress. After all, you goose, it won't run away because we leave it. Everything will be exactly the same when we return. I don't know, mother, sobbed Hyacinth. You can't tell. I'm afraid to go. Besides, it wouldn't be fair. Not fair? What do you mean? Questioned Laura, not completely bewildered. Oh, I don't know, Mommy, but I'm so happy here. Mayn't I stay? Please, please, please. Seeing Hyacinth so hysterically excited, Laura said firmly, We won't talk about it any more now, and began to read aloud to unlistening ears. The next day, Hyacinth seemed much more sensible. Laura told her their departure was quite settled, and she made an obvious effort to accept the inevitable with as good grace as possible, but she looked pale and strained, and her manner was even more usually preoccupied. She looks as though she were trying to propiate herself, Laura explained to her husband. Trying to propiate herself? What an absurd phrase, he laughed. The ideas you have about that child. I haven't any ideas about her, Laura was astonished at the vehemence of her own voice. Laura spent most of Christmas Eve decorating a small tree for Hyacinth. When she brought it upstairs, gay with glittering tinsel, gilded walnuts, and shiny ornaments, the child clapped her hands with delight. Saying she would return in about an hour to light the candles, Laura placed the tree on a table in front of the fire. When she came back, she was surprised to find the room illuminated by the glimmer of little wax candles. Hyson seemed asleep, but sat up as the door opened. Assuming the child had prevailed on Bessie, the maid to light the candles, Laura merely said, Well, I must say, after all my trouble, I do think you might have waited for me. Never mind. Now, let's pull the crackers together. Shamefacedly, Hyson pointed to the colored tatters of two dozen exploded crackers. Her bed was strewn with paper caps, mottos, and little tin musical instruments. Sorry, Mummy. I just couldn't wait, she mumbled. I love candles. Flames are such fun, aren't they? May I have some toy fireworks, please, Mummy? I don't know. I think they're rather dangerous. Oh, no, Mummy, they aren't. Please say I may have some. I know. I'll ask Daddy to give me some. He told me to tell him what I wanted. Laura went to find Bessie. You should have asked me before lighting the candles on the Christmas tree, she said severely. It wasn't at all safe to leave Miss Hythens alone in the room with all those candles alight. They often set fire to a bit of the tree. There should always be someone at hand with a wet sponge. I'm surprised at you, Bessie. I didn't never light no tree, my lady, said the astonished maid. I haven't been into Miss Hythens' room. Not for two hours. Laura hurried back to Hyacinth. I don't want to scold you on Christmas Eve, but it was very naughty of you to get out of bed to light the candles. When you know perfectly well, you're still forbidden to put your foot to the ground. And isn't it rather selfish to pull the crackers by yourself? Hyacinth blushed, but the expression on her face was unmistakably one of relief. Sorry, Mummy, she said. So sorry. And impetuously she flung her arms around her mother's neck and kissed her quickly, lovingly, just as she used in the days when she was lonely. At last, Hyacinth's ankle was sufficiently recovered to allow the Hallyards to make their plans for leaving the next day. That evening, Claude was to dine out with an old school fellow who lived about four miles away. Before starting, he went up to say good night to Hyacinth. Her half-packed trunk was open and she was practicing getting about the room. Don't ruin my tie, he cried, as hopping toward him, she flung her thin arms around his neck. Bother your tie, she laughed. Oh, Daddy, darling Daddy, thank you for the lovely, lovely box of fireworks. They came by the afternoon post. Aren't they gorgeous? Look at the lovely pictures on the lid. Whiz bangs, Catherine wheels and all. Oh, they've come, have they? Well, mind, you aren't at any account to touch them. 
I'll let them off for you the first evening we come home. I'll carry them away now and lock them up somewhere safe. Oh, mayn't they stay here, Daddy? I like looking at the pictures. Certainly not. I can't trust you not to touch them. Hyson stood flushed and pouting. Suddenly she turned towards the window. Oh, look, Daddy, she cried, pointing. Look at that great white owl. Oh, what a lovely Mrs. Fly-by-Night. Where, Hyacinth? I can't see it. No, Daddy? You aren't looking where I'm pointing. Can't you see? She's just flown over the church tower. But look where he might. Claude could see no owl. He was still trying to be guided by Hyacinth's erratically pointed finger when the butler came in and announced his car. Well, then, I must give the owl up, he said. My friend's a great stickler for punctuality. And kissing Hyacinth, who made no effort to detain him, he left the room quite forgetting the box of fireworks he had left lying on the table. As he was about to step into his car, he overheard a mocking tuitawoo. Remembering an accomplishment of Hyacinth's, she could imitate an owl by whistling through her hands. He looked up towards her window. There she was, leaning far out, her red head gleaming, her pale face strangely elfin in the moonlight. Claude was startled by her beauty. Go to bed, Sprite, he called. Hyacinth waved her thin white arms. Good night, Daddy. See you in the morning. Though bitterly cold, the still starlit night was so beautiful that Cloud decided to walk home and dismiss his car. He and his friend found much to say to one another, and it was past midnight before he started home. As he strode across the frozen fields, he began to regret his dismissal of the car. The cold, clear silence was only broken by his own footsteps, the occasional hoot of an owl and the far, far away bark of a lonely dog. He felt too much alone in a white, unshared world. The present in which Claude always strove to unwrap himself receded and faded. Quite powerless to protect him from the past, it became a mere dissolving mist. A man maimed by one memory. He depended on contact with immediate external things to preoccupy him, to claim his attention so urgently that his senses might not be reassailed by certain ineffaceable impressions. Just now he felt abandoned to the past, unprotected by the passage of time. What were time and space but modes of thought? There could be no putting distance between yourself and any experience. What had all the intervening years availed to release him? Nothing. Claude Halyard had paid dearly for his inheritance. That strained expression friends noticed on his face was due not to the effort to remember, but to the effort to forget, to expunge from his consciousness a haunting memory from which there was no release. And if I seek oblivion of an hour, so shorten I the stature of my soul. In Claude's life there is one hour which he ceaselessly and desperately seeks oblivion. Struggle as he may, he is now caught back in that hour, forced to relive each agonizing instant. It is superimposed on his present, and all the impressions of twelve intervening years are powerless to soften any of its intensity. Twelve years ago, it is a moonlit night, and as now he is walking towards Lichen Hall, the beautiful home of his childhood, the home which so obsesses his imagination that to him it seems the core of the entire world. Such love, he feels, should surely establish ownership, but Lichen Hall is not entailed on the male line, and at the death of its present owner, his widowed and crippled brother, it will pass to that brother's only child, Daphne who in time will marry and transfer all that wonderful beauty to strangers. He reaches the edge of the park. What is it that so startles him? What strange, terrifying sounds? God, the alarm bell in the great tower is clanging furiously. Fire, fire, he hears the word shouted. Sick with dread, he rushes towards the house from which his horror-struck eyes see wreaths of smoke curling. Terrible crackling sounds are coming from one wing, and from the little turret tower in that wing, long ribbons of flame flutter towards the white moon. Breathless, he reaches the lawn. The distracted servants have just carried someone out of the house. It is his crippled brother. Claude rushes to him, struggling to raise his paralyzed body. The agonized man clutches at Claude and points towards the house, shrieks, Daphne! Daphne! Claude realizes the situation. The fire brigade has not yet arrived, and Daphne, who sleeps in the turret tower, of the burning wing has not been got out. The alarm has only just been given, as it is merely a few minutes since the servants were aroused, the fire having gained a strong hold before any of them awoke. So far, they have only just time to carry down their helpless master, the child they hope, 
would have woken and escaped. They expected to find her outside, but to their dismay, she is nowhere to be seen. With a reassuring shout, Claude dashes into the house. The staircase leading up to the burning wing is already tense with smoke. Claude smashes a window and, choking, fights his way up and into the suffocating room where he sees Daphne on the floor, lying close to the window. The smoke has been too much for her. She is unconscious, quite unconscious, but breathing. He is in time. Quite easy to fling that light burden over his shoulder to dash down the stairs and carry her safely out into the blessed air. Vividly, Claude sees himself doing this, sees the joy blaze in his brother's eyes. Simultaneously, an alternative picture presents itself. The child left lying as she is, unconscious, quite unconscious, not suffering, not dreading, not knowing, just not reawakening, unaware, his own future, Lichen Hall. His body seems to act without any conscious volition. Something takes command of his limbs. I never told myself to do it. I never told myself to do it. How often thereafter was he to mutter those words? Stooping, he lifts the light body. The burnished red hair brushes against his cheek. In a moment, he has shoved her safely out of sight. Now for the stairs. They have become almost impassable. He emerges choking. I can't find her, he gasps to the horrified crowd. She's not in her room. She must have got out. A frantic scream from his brother. Two minutes later, the fire brigade dashes off. Claude takes control, directs the firemen to search for Daphne and every room except her own. Now he sees the glowing, writhing roof of the little turret tower fall in. Soon the flames are extinguished. All the pictures are saved. The body of a child is found. Unfortunately, the poor little girl taken refuge beneath her bed and therefore her gallant uncle was unable to find her. The coroner's verdict. Daphne's father. Oh God, his eyes. Claude has lived through each moment just as intensely as twelve years ago. Shaking, dripping with perspiration, he drops back into the present. He still sees his brother's eyes. Had he loved his Daphne as I love my Hyacinth? At the thought, Claude's heart contracts agonizingly. Suppose he had. Why not? Was she not as lovely as piercingly sweet and young, her eagerness? Had he not loved her himself, his dear little niece, the perfect playfellow he used to call her? The last evening he had gone to say good night to see her in her little caparcio bed. Time to go to sleep, he had said. Oh, bother sleep, she had exclaimed, imploring him to remain. I haven't had enough time to play. Once more he feels the light burden in his arms, the unconscious little body, that would so easily have revived to entertain its eager spirit, to welcome it back to the life it loved. Not nearly time enough to play. Claude's mind struggled from the past to the present, to the past again and back to the present. Not nearly time enough to play? The galloping riderless rocking horse, Hyacinth running races alone, his wife's strange impulses, hide and seek. Who is it that seeks? These and other things flit through his strained mind. He is nearly home now, home to Lauren Hyson, and tomorrow night they will all three be far from here. Yes, but in the meantime he is still so much in the grip of that fatal hour twelve years ago that he seems actually to hear that awful clanging in the cries of fire, fire. Heavens, how real, how outside himself these hideous sounds seem, but this is past bearing. Are his senses hopelessly haunted? This way lies madness. He must go away. Let the house. Return to America. The sounds are insistent. Grow louder. The illusion is complete. God, can it really be now? Turning the corner which brings the distant house into view, Claude stares. Yes, it is true. The present and the past are fused. The bell, the shouts are actual, immediate. It is twelve years later, but Lichen Hall is again on fire and burning, burning furiously. How can a fire have taken so strong a hold? Every modern device for extinguishing an outbreak had been installed. Claude tears up the hill and reaches the lawn. This time it is the other wing that has caught fire, that in which he, Laura, and Heisen sleep. Its top story is already blazing. A crowd stares upward, pale faces red in the reflected glow. That shrieking woman struggling to escape from arms that hold her back. Can that be Laura? Disjointedly from various voices, Claude learns the situation. The water supply is frozen, all the pipes useless. The telephone wires are broken down, but the car has gone for the fire brigade. 
Any moment now they should be here. In the meantime, the child, the child is upstairs in the wooden staircase, is impassable, was already so before anyone got up to bed, and as only the family sleep in that wing, no one was there. The child is alone up there, trapped in that red horror, and the longest ladder cannot reach to the window of a room. A second ladder? Yes, they are tying two together with ropes, and several men have offered to climb up. Claude shouts that he will go himself. Thank God the ladders are now securely fastened together. There is still time, but none to lose. The roof must soon fall in. The ladder has been placed against the wall under Hyson's room. Claude's foot is already on the second rung, when something catches his eye. At a window, there to the right of the one to which he is climbing, he sees a child appear. The window is open. Her long, thin arms outstretched, her red hair gleams in the flaring light. Move the ladder! Quick, quick! Claude yells distractedly. She is in, in her bedroom. She's gone into the other room, the playroom. There! There! Can't you see her? They're hanging out of that window. No one sees anything, but blindly they obey. There is a rush, and eager arms carry out his order. The ladder is dragged away to the other window, at which Claude is pointing. It's ready now. Cheers ring out. Claude climbs up, up, up. Near the top, he raises his head and finds himself staring into the smiling face of the girl who had perished in the flames twelve years ago. As Claude stares transfixed, the lovely smiling face blurs and fades away. No one is there. With a cry no one below could ever forget, Claude hurls himself down the ladder. The other window, he gasps. Back to the other window. Wonderfully quickly, the ladder is moved and replaced, but not quickly enough. The delay has been fatal. Just as a fire engine swore up to drive, the roof falls in. Again, every picture is saved, and a little body is recovered.